Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and welcome to Runway Project Part 2, which confusingly is covering Round 3. So, yeah, Round 3, the theme of the game was to have big engines. Everybody had to have a single Goliath high bypass turbofan engine, which is obviously not appropriate for a high maneuverability fighter plane but many people made it work in their own way. This is a fine example from Commander 777777, uh, and of course, not only did he take somebody else out, but he also got torn apart by John F. President, who was flying in this, well, spiky masterpiece. And of course, how a plane looks is a big part of how it scores, so this time I wanted participants to include an image and a haiku of their aircraft. Look down on Kerbin, remember my past mistakes. Do not repeat them. An engine to fight, with weapons to match its might. Brrrr. <laughs> not really sure that's a haiku. The lion searching for prey, the rumbling autocannons. Four falls into the blue. Noctilucent clouds, how an empty desert booms before the sun's rise. A spike through the air, an unforgiving fighter. It makes the skies clear. And yeah, you know, we g continue the theme, as you can imagine. Some haikus are better than others, some were kind of graphic, and others were more statements by the individuals that they really couldn't write haikus. But of course, these artistic endeavours were judged by an audience, an audience that was usually you know, drinking and chilling out watching Twitch, whereas the actual performance in the combat was measured by a soulless computer simulating their pilots performing their you know, miraculous manoeuvres in the sky. So this is one round. You can see Rays there using detachable undercarriage. Uh, this was pushing robots entry, the gallant peacock or the tesseract. Unfortunately, it had trouble taking off on the rough surface. That has been a constant theme. Things that look great in some environment will fail frequently when they're trying to take off in the actual competition environment. Yeah, that thing did actually fly marvelously well once it was in the air. So for this round, we moved the competition to one of the canyons on Kerbin to provide some you know, interesting terrain that they might fly into. And just over a minute into the battle, Professor Biscuit is blown out of the sky by Pierre. And that was a brutal hit. Sometimes the aircraft are merely wounded and they fall to the surface. Uh, this is Stardust, who decided to go for a lot of reaction wheels and gimballing, which obviously makes him ripe for getting points penalised in terms of looks. Although the cockpit view was pretty clear. This is uh, Polkov Nikadis, I'm not sure, I probably mispronounced that. Interesting design, which actually proved to be really stable. Even with the tailplane shot off, that thing managed to fly really well. This is Rays, of course, who decided to call his plane Purple Rays on account of the purple lights. Uh, and unfortunately, the lights don't help it fly in a straight line all the time. It has an interesting tailplane design, you'll note. It has a big wide horizontal stabilizer with multiple uh, canards sitting above and below it. This is him trying to line up a shot against Pierre, but it seems that Pierre is flying significantly closer and they almost collide. Now, of course, everything turns around and Pierre is the one coming down and looking for a target. And that's Polkov using a mass of weapons to shoot uh, rice corn out of the sky. Rice corn still isn't officially out. He is at this point spiraling towards the surface where he will be eliminated once he crashes. For this round, there was no limits on how many guns could be fitted. They just all had to be forward-facing weapons. So most people went with the Vulcan cannons or the Gao 8 Avengers. And some people went with a very large number. And the hail of fire can knock things out of the sky with extreme efficiency. So there Polkov actually got knocked out of the sky and if you remember, Ricecorn was the one he killed previously, but Ricecorn actually survived longer, so therefore gets more points. In fact, he lived a few seconds longer than Pronga as well, so he did pretty well. Pierre finally has damage which takes his engine out of commission, and that at this point requires a GM intervention to make sure he's eliminated from the running. So that leaves Purple Rays versus Stardust. And I'm pretty sure those are both brand names for medicinal substances that are legal to sell in California. From the cockpit of uh, Stardust, we get to see all six of his guns converging on rays there. 
and that managed to strip off most of his tail control surfaces so he ends up crashing into the ground and Stardust takes the round. The competition would of course work by running many rounds to average out scores with different teams in different brackets. Now some planes would do great on artistic points but actually turn out to be really really bad at flying. Uh, this one in particular was a tribute to the band Weezer with a wing shaped which um, yeah totally embodies the band but with a single Goliath turbofan engine it had problems climbing. Uh, it would typically try to take off and then stall and fall. I mean, I had anticipated that this thing might happen, which is why they launch over a cliff, hoping to give them a bit more chance to clear the ground. But even with that, the AI wasn't always able to understand that it was flying something that really wasn't meant for flight. But of course, I'm smarter than the AI, and I was able to get it airborne, and you know, now, once it was airborne, we were able to truly appreciate its formidable warfighting capabilities. Well, that's the theory. I mean, before it could even begin considering climbing to combat altitude, it had to fly horizontally, and it, actually, at some points, I was worried it would hit the other side of the canyon before we got any altitude. And while Maxwell was trying to gain altitude, the other aircraft were, of course, doing their thing, flying around, shooting things, exploding. And uh, yeah, it was only a matter of time until somebody spotted uh, Mr. W down on the ground and descended from above to deliver a hail of ammunition that fell on him a little harder than the rains down in Africa. And you know, he had so much wing surface, it even took a long time for him to crash. So I want to go back to another aircraft that had a hard time taking off. That was, of course, Pushing Robot with his Tesseract. Again, in this case, it was partly down to the surface and partly down to the AI, but it was totally possible to get this thing airborne. And I'm going to say, as a cockpit view, that's kind of cool. Makes me feel like I'm a, I'm a TIE Fighter pilot. Except that unlike TIE Fighter pilots, this is totally not expendable. So, uh, yeah, this actually manoeuvred pretty well in the air. This is an engagement against Purple Rays, who we all know and love already. And, yeah, the Tesseract is able to move around into the 6 o'clock position and already knock chunks off of Rays. Of course, they were also up against Stardust in the same round, and Stardust did do the whole TIE Fighter thing, again, actually pretty effectively. I mean, I love this shot here where he's basically ch pursuing the pursuer and blows him out of the sky. And then, just to be sure, he continues to attack the wreckage as it's falling from the sky and makes sure that there's no nothing that will ever come back to get its revenge. So the round actually ended with these two vessels, you know, going head to head against each other, which probably says that they're they're both really pushing the limits of the accuracy of the physics. Note that uh, Pushing Robot at this point had a little bit of a stability issue, but he was able to recover. I mean, with all those wings, it's just a question of the AI figuring out how to keep it in the air. Again, he takes more hits from Stardust, but keeps on flying. I mean, despite not being able to get into the air off of those dirt runways, this aircraft showed a lot of maneuverability and a lot of survivability, even after chunks of it had been blown off. Basically, the last half of the battle was just these two trying to maneuver around each other and get a hit. Unfortunately, Pushing Robot really had a hard time matching up against Stardust's superior maneuverability, but uh, it was a valiant effort, and I'm very proud of this vehicle. And since we're talking about TIE Fighters, you gotta talk about the Die Interceptor by TechCast Pork, which pretty much flew like a TIE Fighter, looked like a TIE Fighter, and you could sit inside it and imagine that you were flying a TIE Fighter that had some serious t uh, firepower. This is him shooting down Teflon Mike, who also uses the same cockpit, which shows you that it's more than just the cockpit that makes the TIE Fighter. Another notable entry is Dan Cord. Engine backfires, but imagine passengers. The droop suit snoot don't droop. This is uh, basically tried to make something that looked like Concorde and well initially it wasn't doing too well in its first round it lost a bit of its wing obviously it's not really Concorde because it has a single big tur turbofan in there instead of the Olympus engines so this was by Penguin and this aircraft spent most of the round sparring with King Komodo which had a wide forward swept wing design 
And yeah, this managed to severely clip the wings of this Concorde wannabe, but it remained airborne. I'm not sure what it says for his aerodynamics that after that happened he was much more formidable in the sky, able to put more hits on his targets. This rounded up with the nubby narwhal King Komodo and Penguin just dicing it out in the sky. And uh, yeah, surprisingly, Penguin, despite having his wings clipped, he turned around and, and began to dominate the fight. Again, it's always marvellous to watch this on Twitch because everybody starts getting behind the one that's losing. And sure enough, the damaged Dancord ends up winning the day and King Komodo loses a whole wing. Uh, yeah, and with wings like that, you're pretty much spiralling into the ground. What a victory that was. Congratulations. The entrant who would actually win the round was Sturmhawk, and his whole concept was take the engine and make it bigger. So the whole six-sided uh, duct was supposed to be one giant jet engine. And that made for this interesting finale in Phase 1, where he actually rammed one of the targets. Obviously the AI isn't supposed to do that, but sometimes it happens. His aircraft actually managed to recover. It sustained some damage here and there, but it ended up flying out of it, while his target uh, ended up spinning off towards the ground, marking a kill by uh, ramming gave him extra points that helped him come to first place in the round. But of course, that was combined with great maneuverability and combat efficiency. This is him dispatching Vulcan to take that round after that ram. So overall, I think we had 40 valid entries and we actually ran five rounds for each of our five phases. So Sturmhawk came out on top, but there were plenty of other strong contenders. We add in the scores to the live stream and some people come high, some people come low. Sauce Boss was at the bottom because his aircraft had a surface control AI. But when all the scores for the first three rounds were added up, Lavie 154 continued to hold out a lead over Rice Corn and Sky Sack. Uh, yeah, the Gao 8 go brr, Delta Wings like a Typhoon. Team Dank Tank will fight, and we will continue to fight. You, I will have some other videos showing some edit together highlights, or just completely unedited highlights, so you can watch much more of this. We'll have the Twitch stream on Tuesday nights. We are actually on to round 5, and we're about to announce round 6. We have a lot of entries, so I don't really need more work, but... I'm sure some of you are interested. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.